Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein. Climate change. Science is in, and 97% of climate scientists agree that the problem is real and that it's human caused. So there's really no doubt about it. So why is it so difficult to move the issue forward in terms of public concern and also action? Well, it seems that it's an issue of communications, an issue of language. And joining us is one of the best communicators in New York City to talk about the language of climate change, and that is Brian Lair, the host of WNYC's Brian Lair Show. Brian, welcome to Green Gotham. Hi, Lou. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for joining us. Your show is a must listen. And your audience is, I'd say, above average intelligence. Of course, that has nothing to do with the fact that I'm one of them. But Not just above <laughs> average. They're 99th percentile. That's, that's right. That's right. So I'm going to imagine that they, in the main, care about climate change and are engaged in this issue to some extent. Yeah. Um, my listeners will certainly get engaged in the climate change issue. I know that one of your concerns is that media doesn't take it on all that much because they have trouble finding ways to communicate it yes. in ways that make it seem relatable to yeah. media audiences. Because our audience is very issue-oriented, very community-minded, we don't have that problem so much. Also, we live in New York City, which experienced Sandy. And I think that changed the game. In our area, all of a sudden, Governor Cuomo was talking about climate change in explicit terms. Um, you know, Governor Christie in New Jersey to an extent, quite, you know, but he hugged the president. Exactly. And Malloy talks about it. In Connecticut. And, and so, you know, uh, after Sandy, after Irene, followed by Sandy, there's not as much difficulty getting people engaged in this area as maybe some other areas. Did you notice kind of that was a demarcation point? There's like a before Sandy and after Sandy in terms of that issue on your show? Not so much in my audience because, again, people are interested in environmental issues uh, in my audience in general. And so, you know, a, a big earthquake, uh, that's probably a bad choice of terms right. in, uh, in this. But, you know, when Al Gore's film came out, An Inconvenient Truth. Yeah, it's like a decade ago now. Unbelievable. And so everybody wanted to talk about that at that time. So it's not new for us. So, but going broader beyond your show, um, it, see, it, this issue, you know, always ranks near the bottom when you ask Americans about their concern, what they're concerned about. And uh, I think language is one part of it, but do you have a sense, kind of looking at it from 30,000 feet, what that could, what could that be about? The reluctance? Well, you know, people, I, I think, understandably, are uh, most concerned about the things that are most immediate and of most tangible concern. So the economy and their kids' education and the things you crime. tend to think of, crime certainly, near the top of the list. Um, and this is more abstract and potentially catastrophic, but kind of vague, even if people accept that 97% of scientists agree that it's real. They still don't know when it's coming, to what extent it's going to affect them. Um, or don't buy that it is already happening. Or don't want to buy it, even if they buy the overall premise. Right. I mean, look at, you know, there's this whole field that you probably know about called risk perception. Right. Right? Right. Kind of a psychology of how we perceive environmental risk and other risks. So look at airplanes versus cars, for example. When people get in a car, do they get the shakes and think, oh my God, we're taking off now onto the Grand Central Parkway. What's going to happen? You know? I mean, the Grand Central Parkway might maybe not, but the Van Wick, you but don't want to go there. Definitely the Van Wick. Uh, but the, you know, but, but you get it, you get that little 
thing that people get in an airplane as you're taking off or as, as you're landing, different people to different degrees, of course. But statistically, uh, most years there are zero deaths of passengers on commercial airliners in the United States, and we know how hazardous and how actually risky it is to uh, be a passenger or a driver in a car. But because that's familiar to us, because we feel like we're in control when we're driving, things like that, those things affect our perception. So I think similarly with the, um, with the economy, with the economy, with global warming, um, people are more concerned about things in the economy where they can feel the money coming and going from their hands, but this catastrophic risk that might take place seems abstract. And so not, I think the polls don't reflect that people don't care, but when it gets ranked below those other things, it needs something to trigger it. It needs something sal to make it salient as a voting issue. So probably, I'm guessing, after Sandy or after Katrina in New Orleans or some of the other events. It spikes up. It spikes. And after An Inconvenient Truth, it spikes up. But then it goes back down. And to, to your point about risk, it, there is a book, um, Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Hotwired to Ignore Climate Change by George Marshall. And he talks about that very subject. But he puts it in a different frame where he's talking about we spend you know, gazillions of dollars, I'm, I don't know what our defense budget is, but it's a lot of zeros, for, you know, or our anti-terrorism budget, which is a lot of zeros, and, and we've been successful, but even when we're not successful, it's it, the amount of people affected by terrorism right. is relatively small, right. not that, I mean, it's obviously horrible and not minimizing it. On the other hand, climate change, you know, 97% of scientists, we have a 97% chance basically of having a major catastrophe that could dwarf anything that we've seen, but yet people don't perceive it that right. way. And I think though that but it makes sense. there's enough uncertainty in the science that even though 97% of scientists agree that this is real and man-made and getting worse, um, there's still some uncertainty about how bad it's going to get, and so it becomes difficult to communicate. And when. And when, um, and where, for that matter. Right. So it becomes difficult to communicate, and that's another reason that people have difficulty feeling that it's, it's my issue right now. And it's not a simple issue. That's the other thing. It's, as I've delved into this, it's many issues. Climate change is not one thing. It's not, you know, it's not, we got bombed on Pearl Harbor, we know who our enemy is. This is a multifactorial problem right. that is, and we are the cause. And you know, when environmentalists talk about it, they're always looking for hooks because of this difficulty that you're describing. Keystone. And so, Keystone is one, but you've used military comparisons twice already, right. comparing to terrorism or Pearl Harbor. Um, one of the terms that environmentalists are using is climate insecurity. Right. Uh, right, which you know is different than another term that they sometimes use, climate instability, because instability is supposed to make you feel anxious. Oh, something's unstable. This is not good. I like stability, predictability, but insecurity puts it in national security terms, and there are of course national security implications if climate change becomes really bad. For one thing, it can exacerbate conflicts Absolutely. in it's areas a of the multiplier. world parts of Africa that are already being affected. Syria. Um, and uh, even Syria has, you know, one of the elements of that conflict. Drought. Seems like it's drought, which is exacerbated by the warming of the planet, and so it brings populations into conflict with each other. So um, people are even trying to use national security language so that it becomes, for people who are concerned about military type issues and national security, near the top of their list of concerns, um, that they start to think of climate change in that realm. And the Defense Department is actually pretty much ahead of the game in that they are preparing for climate change and, and looking at adaptation strategies. How can we deal with it better as it is happening now? Right, and if you look at the, some of the institutions that are outside of politics, but that need a clear-eyed assessment of risks in the world for their own purposes. And I'll take two as examples in this case, the military and the insurance industry. 
not that they're not political. Right. I was like, <laughs> but for wait a minute now. <laughs> but they're political, and you know, in all the ways we know, they're political lobbying for their interests. But when they're coming up with their own actuarial tables and figuring out how to set premiums so that they make more money than they have to pay out in terms of risks, um, they're they're certainly not climate deniers. Oh, absolutely not. In fact, I was on a panel with folks from Swiss Re, who is, I think, either number one or number two insurance, reinsurance company. So they insure insurance companies. So they're the right. most risk averse, right. right? And they said in terms of 10, 20, 50 year purviews, but 10 is not that far off, climate change and the effects from it, the ripple effects from it is the number one thing that they're worried about. The number one thing. And, and I was shocked. But that still makes me even more, more kind of surprised that there's still this gulf between, yes, we know the problem, but we're not there yet in terms of acting on it. And yes, I, what we've talked about so far explains some of it. But some of it to me is in terms of the way the issue is framed also. And we were, we were talking off air about just the way the language has changed from global warming to climate change. Um, greenhouse, maybe, the greenhouse the greenhouse effect. Effect. So maybe that, you could, Nobody says that anymore. So where have you, what's your take on that kind of evolution and, and how that's affected inaction or action? Well, we know there was a conscious attempt to change the language on the part of Republican pollster Frank Luntz in the early 2000s, like 2002 or so, I think. He's um, the guy who does interviews with uh, focus groups and then extrapolates and says this is going to be the big trend for this election. Right. And also not just measures public opinion, but he's also a strategist with the Republican Party and comes up with um, terms and phrases and words that he thinks are going to be effective for them. So about, you know, 12, 13 years ago, um, according to, you know, various histories that I've read, he came up with the term climate change, which he told President Bush would be better to use than global warming, which was the standard term that the media was using and politicians were using at that time. Because he surmised, probably based on some focus group tests, that global warming sounds threatening. Oh, the planet is getting hot. Climate change sounds neutral, like change, yeah, okay, climate is the climate, change, well, change doesn't tell you in what direction, change doesn't tell you if something is good and bad, it, or good or bad. It's just changing a flight or changing your, you know, your, yeah. your shirt. So, um, the, he was trying to take the electricity out of the term. I don't happen to think it's worked, you know, I think that they're used interchangeably now, um, and I used to get calls from environmentalists who would complain if I use the term climate change because they oh, you're, you're accepting the Republican talking point. Uh, but the only reason I say it is because it's so accepted as a um, general uh, term for, for this, along with global warming. I tend to use them interchangeably. And my sense is that they land interchangeably, that journalistically, neither of those terms biases the conversation or favors one side over the other. Uh, because I, I think people respond, and I think polls have shown that um, climate change and global warming are used about a similar percentage of the time in the media and that people have about similar perceptions of the threat from them. See, my thing is I look at it, I, and I, we were talking about this, I have the opposite of, of what your listeners were talking about and that I have the opposite point of view and that I think global warming is very comfortable. Like, you go under a blanket, you're it's warm. Warming. It feels warm and cuddly. Climate change seems more serious. And I actually prefer to use the verbiage of Al Gore in this case, which is climate crisis, because that puts it into the here and now. Now, that may turn some people off, but, well, that's the reality. You know, so I actually think right. that term has not gotten much uh, currency yeah, just and yet. I can see where that term would be tough. Um, I don't think I've used that except to refer to Al Gore's language um, because a crisis is usually something that you're in the throes of and that it's acute 
and all around you right now. And there may be a climate crisis in real terms, but it's not measured in that acute sense of, you know, there's Hurricane Sandy happening around us right now. That's a crisis right now. The lights are out, the streets are flooded, et cetera. That feels like a crisis. This gradual shift to something that may be very threatening and catastrophic, crisis seems like the wrong word in terms of the time frame in which we usually experience crisis. Right, and that therein lies the problem because it almost takes crisis for there to be action, right? Again, I'll use the military, uh, you know, the military analogy. We didn't get into World War II until we were attacked. That was a crisis. And this is this is the challenge. classic in environmental terms, uh, in environmental history. And the question is, is it going to be too late? So when you know people wanted to talk about toxic chemicals in the water supply and things like that, well, again, it's scary, but it sounds like an abstract threat. And then way back in the 1970s, something like Love Canal happened, right? Where yes. there were actually cancer clusters um, upstate, upstate near the in the Buffalo area, where where you know, kids and grown-ups were getting sick. They were getting cancer, and they figured out that it was from uh, toxic substances. Well, that's a crisis. And so then policy reacts to really tangible crises. And from that, we got Superfund and, uh, and things like that. And a lot like of cleanups. That, right? And in, you know, the 1970s, even earlier in the 70s, kind of the the, the fundamental uh, environmental laws that we have now, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, you know, when, um, was it Lake Erie or the Ohio River or something? It was, the Cuyahoga, it was the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. Caught fire. Yeah, and uh, Kucinich was the mayor, I think. Maybe. Um, and the, the, or the, um, you know, the pollution is so thick in the air that people Smog. are. Smog. Yeah, pe people are, you know, they have that in China now. I was in That's Beijing. And people routinely walk down the street wearing masks. Um, I mean, it's a huge problem in China. China is at once, you know, with all their economic growth, putting more and more coal exactly. plants on. Right. But they're also right. leading right. the world in wind and solar, right. and they are actually committing to some kind of uh, emissions reductions. And we've cleaned up a lot of that type of pollution. Yes. Because there was a crisis in a way that people could feel in their bodies right now, in their neighborhoods right now, and policy responded to that. So maybe one of the things that's going to happen is that there are going to have to be enough Sandys and things like that that can be tied explicitly to global warming or climate change, and only then will policy really react. And then the question is, how much is that going to be too late? And, it, it, the pr and it, it's a big problem because this kind of thing, even with the Sandys, is to me like the lobster who's in the pot and you're just raising the temperature every, you know, a, a, a half a degree every so often and the lobster doesn't feel it and then all of a sudden he, he's boiling. Right. And but there are positive ways to frame it too, you know, um, like green. People like the value of being green. Look, look what's happening with um, the food industry. Uh, all the these restaurants and, absolutely. and stores, uh, you know, Chipotle saying they're not going to use GMO ingredients anymore. Uh, even McDonald's is going away from chicken, I think, with antibiotics. They've already, I think they've already done it. Something like that. Um, so this is from, yes, it's from public fear about what those things might do to their personal health, but it's also from this kind of sense that there's a positive value in going green, in another positive word, sustainability. Uh, this what do you think of that word? Sustainability? Yes. Um, well, I certainly think it's caught on. It, it, you know? it has. It's ho sometimes hard to define what it is, but... Right, but it's usually... To me, the positive side of the coin, you know, the opposite of which is the threat from right. global warming. People want things to be sustainable, so we want sustainable buildings that, uh, you know, the lights turn off automatically at the end of the workday in the office buildings when they empty out or whatever the sustainability factor might be, and they make fe people feel good, these things. Nobody wants to be a litterer. Nobody wants to be a polluter. And so there, there's another whole, uh, you know, thread 
with respect to environment and language. Well, I think you're you're onto something there, and that's one of the uh, the idea of community in this because in the problem, it's not like yeah, wealthy people might be able to build their way to safety, uh, and, and obviously in poor nations they're going to feel the brunt of it, but really we all breathe the same air, we all are in the same environment. This is a, a, planetary, pro a planetary problem, and when I give talks on this, which I do through the Climate Reality Project and speak to groups about climate change, I also talk in the language of opportunity, because the idea is that this is a huge problem. Problems have solutions. People who solve things, A, make a living, and by the way, you're getting to solve, you know, how we're going to power our, our cars and how we're going to heat and cool our buildings and how we're going to do so in a clean manner. How cool is that? So I, when I talk mm -hmm. to, the, to the younger generations, I say, you know, you're welcome. Right. And Mayor Bloomberg, when he came up with his sustainability uh, initiative called Plan YC 2030, right? Yes. That we're going to be 9 million people in New York City by the year 2030 and he wants us to be environmentally sound in all these various ways and this was in his words a sustainability agenda it wasn't a prevent global warming agenda so it had that positive cast and and i think that's something that we as humanity needs to grab onto but we in the environmental world need to also grab onto because it can you know gloom and doom can be a problem in and of itself. And that's one of the, the knocks on environmentalists is that they're chicken littles, always uh, purveying gloom and doom, and that they're pessimists about uh, humanity's ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions or other things like that. But I do think that's changing. I, I, I mean, it hasn't completely obviously flipped, but it is changing. And all you have to do is look at Al Gore is an example, right? I mean, when An Inconvenient Truth came out, I mean, that's how I got part of this hairline, just watching that movie. Uh, you know, it, it was depressing more than anything else and eye-opening. But now, if you hear him talk, and he does 24 hours of reality, and he d has got this group of 5,000 people, of which I'm one, going out and giving presentations, it emphasizes the solutions. It emphasizes positivity, and it emphasizes, hey, we, can we can solve this now it's a, a question of having the will both individual will and political will to do it and then you get even the pope who made such a splash when he came out with his encyclical on um, global warming as a real inequality problem and talk about issues and how they match up and language and how it matches up we mentioned national security before aligning inequality which is such a big global concern now with um, global warming, that probably will make a lot of people look at it in a whole new light who may not have thought about it before. But again, he will be labeled by the critics a pessimist um, for saying we can't live the consumerist, materialistic lifestyles that people in the West have become accustomed to without uh, adapting or without doom and gloom being the result, rather than ingenuity, being able to adapt our way uh, into this new climate or out of the threat in some other kind of ways rather than by cutting back, cutting back, cu cutting back. So the, the two sides have their various uh, language thrusts. Looking forward, you know, I, and in our political climate particularly, to get anything done in Congress, you have to get Republicans. They, control both houses. They may, it looks like they're going to control the house for quite a while. What kind of language do you think we can use to get them, not all of them, but enough of them, on board? Because conserve, Asian, conservation, and right. conserve, a TIV, are the same root. Come on, guys yeah. and ladies. Uh, well, you know, I'm a journalist. I'm not in the business of coming up with the language for activists, right. but the so I don't know the and I don't know the answer to your question but it's interesting to see the retrenchment from the Republicans own language of cap and trade which was largely a Republican idea 
um, that goes back to the ozone layer it's problem. It's market based. Market based. That's why they liked it. They liked the individual mandate on health care until they didn't. They liked it until they didn't. They Be were for it until that, they were against it. Exactly. That was also considered, you know, a market based way to get to full health insurance. And what else is the individual mandate? It's personal responsibility, which is a Republican value. Um, so cap and trade, yes, let the market buy and sell pollution credits um, after the government establishes what the safe level of overall pollution is for the climate, right? Then the markets can work that way. And it worked in Companies not that need um, to emit more carbon in order to do what consumers want them to do. Um, you they have know, to pay for the privilege. Right. So, but then, and, and John McCain ran on cap and trade along with Barack Obama in 2008. They were both for it. Then one of them won and the other one lost and the one who lost was against it. And the one, uh, eventually he was against it, but mostly the Congress, you know, right. came up with a strategy, that is the Republicans in Congress, that they were going to, rather than work with this post-partisan president, um, they were going to just obstruct, obstruct, obstruct on every possible front. And so cap and trade got rebranded a carbon tax, um, which you know you could say it's a carbon tax because if you went above the total level of carbon that was permissible, then you, have to you would be taxed. That was the way they were going to disincentivize exceeding the cap. Um, but then it got rebranded, so it became a bad thing instead of a good. Became thing. a four-letter word, even though it's three. Well, now the uh, with the Citizens Climate Lobby, one a group that I'm working with, I think going ahead is going forward this carbon fee and dividend program where you put a price on carbon, the, the revenue collected goes to the American public without going into the coffers of the government, that's what's going to win. But we will have to see as we're running out of time. Brian, thank you so much for joining us for this illuminating half hour. Uh, we will listen to your program and listen to the language of climate change going forward. And thank you for watching. See us again next time on Green Gotham. Thank you.